Welcome to Beyond the Build, a new series from Shopify where we share stories behind the Shopify ecosystem, a platform where founders, developers, and innovators come to build for more than 1.7 million merchants worldwide. On the show today, we have Andrew Bialecki, co-founder and CEO of Klaviyo. Klaviyo is an email marketing platform created for online businesses, featuring powerful email and SMS marketing automation. They have over 600 employees, 60,000 customers, and recently raised $200 million in Series C funding at a valuation of over $4 billion. Born and raised just outside of Boston, Andrew is proud to be building Clavio in his hometown. Hello, Andrew. Hey, Fatima. How are you doing? Good. How are you? So excited to be here. Yeah, this is going to be awesome. Awesome. Um, so one of the things that um, we really want to do is start telling more stories about like companies grown, built and grown in the ecosystem. So take me back to the beginning of Clavio. Like, where are you, Andrew? How do you come up with this idea? Like, what's the origin story? Yeah, so gosh, that's about nine years ago we started Clavio. So back in 2012, uh, feels like a long time ago. Um, but uh, my co-founder and I, we had, uh, we worked at a software company that did, uh, you know, data analytics for uh, big Fortune 500 retailers. And uh, one of the things, you know, we got introduced there was they had all this first party data about their customers um, from loyalty programs, purchases in store and online. But that wasn't that wasn't as much of a thing as it is now. And, um, you know, it was amazing to, to us that, you know, these biggest companies in the world and they were looking at my co-founder and I and this company we're working at a bunch of 20 somethings to help them figure out what kinds of customers do I have? These kind of like basic customer questions, you know, who's bought from me, how many times? Uh, you know, what are people's different product affinities? And, uh, you know, we built some software that we were charging six, seven figures for them to help solve these problems. And then they were taking all this data analysis of who their customers were. And then, uh, you know, we were kind of exporting it into these big spreadsheets. And uh, they then plumb it back into their, you know, whether it was email or other kinds of parts of the customer experience, loyalty programs. Um, and uh, we just were struck by like, wow, like, Businesses have all this data, you know, about their customers that they're not using, you know, to personalize experiences or marketing. You know, why can't any company do this? Um, and so, uh, yeah, in 2012, um, you know, I had worked at a couple of startups, had a couple of side hustles. I kind of felt this pain myself, um, you know, building web apps and like trying to connect with, you know, all the users who would sign up and, you know, do that kind of at, at scale. Um, and, uh, so anyways, I decided to like quit my job and, uh, I kind of cornered my co-founder. He was at business school at the time and said, Hey, Ed, uh, you know, he's in the second half of his, you know, uh, business school, like two year stint. I was like, I don't think business school people do all that much. Like, do you have a bunch of free time? And, <laughs> you know, we, we, we try hacking on a business with me and if it doesn't work out, like we can just go back to getting regular jobs. But, um, yeah, we started out and it was this idea of, what would happen if you built one place to store all your customer data and then you connected that to all the different customer touch points you had? And, um, you know, because you had all this data, you had all this context and like, that's obviously important for us as we have like human relationships with each other, you know, could totally. you use that to personalize things? Um, cause at the time, you know, a lot of customer experiences just weren't very personal. You think about brand advertising, it's just one size fits all. Right. And so we just had this belief that if you did that, you know, one of the truisms we think about with consumers, they don't like to think they like, you know, they like when people make good suggestions when they, you know who they are. Um, so we figured if we could connect up all this data and we could connect it to marketing uh, and we started with email, then, um, you know, we kind of allow these businesses in some way, rather than having to write these playbooks where their customer support reps or their you know sales team would, you know, kind of deliver these experiences one by one, they could just be the business they wanted to be, um, you know, kind of an internet scale on like a global scale. Um, so anyways, that's, that's, that's a little bit where the idea came from. I remember when we were chatting a little bit and you were telling me how you couldn't get a job at big tech coming out of college. So like, tell me a little bit about that. Oh yeah, sure. So I mean, first of all, for anybody that's listening, I mean, I don't think you need a computer science degree or a programming degree to get into technology or to be a software engineer. I mean, that's just not a requirement. Like really what it takes is just hard work and lots of practice. So you know, for me, I was a physics major and uh, I just remember I was working on this project building this like satellite telescope, like really cool, like the Hubble Space Telescope, gonna look into deep space. And I thought it was awesome. And I remember talking to my advisor and she said, yeah, she's like, you know, if you keep at it, get a PhD, work on this project in 10 years, this thing will launch. And that's if, you know, if the government funding like doesn't get pulled or something. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh boy, I don't know if I can wait 10 years. And um, so I realized, you know, partway through college, you know, I, hey, maybe there's something else. 
um, you know, so I, I uh, got into software, um, you know, was lucky enough to do an internship at Microsoft with like very little programming background. But then I, you know, I applied at the end of school to like, you know, the kind of usual suspects back in, you know, the 20, 2000s, um, Google, Facebook, and it just didn't, didn't even get any interviews. It wasn't even like there was like a callback. It was just like, put my resume in a pile and never heard back. And so from that point, I kind of this chip on my shoulder. I was like, you know, like, I think I could be good at this. Uh, and so I remember that summer after I graduated, I kind of had, you know, hustled myself into a job at this, you know, small software company. I was like, I'm just going to become a really awesome programmer. And, um, you know, I, remember I, I built a little like Facebook clone for some of my friends back in 2007 when social networks were hot and, you know, <laughs> asked my friends to like hack it. And like, they broke all my PHP code and, um, Anyways, but that was like the start of just, you know, I don't know, nights and weekends and my day job, like just trying to become a really great programmer. I love that. I love that. As someone once said to me, having chips on your shoulder can be extremely powerful. You just need to know how to use them um, so that they work for you and not against you. And I think that's like such an awesome example. Uh, cool. So, okay. So t talk to me a little bit. So you're, you're starting the business. It sounds like you really start from the perspective of like, what is the data infrastructure that we would need to allow like personalized experiences to the extent that you can get from like when humans know you and then sort of worked your way backward into the product? Like where, at what point were you like, this should be built on Shopify? Yeah. So, I, so when we started, um, you know, based on some of the little side projects, what else I built, you know, I had had this experience of building websites um, or little, you know, kind of web apps where users would sign up and they would, you know, they'd maybe try all my software, but wouldn't use it, wouldn't stick. So when we started where I was like, you know, I'm going to scratch my own itch. We're going to build Klaviyo to help other tech companies, other startups. And, um, you know, so we started trying to show it to other startups and we had a little bit of traction there, but, um, you know, a friend of mine uh, had built a store on Shopify and he was actually a couple of years in. So I think he started a store back in 2009, 2010. And, uh, you know, he was building on Shopify and said, Hey, you know, I'm building the software that allows you to kind of pull all your customer data in one place and use it to personalize, you know, uh, what, at the time we actually hadn't even figured out the email was the thing yet. I said, would you be interested in like exploring this? And he said, yeah, sure. And, um, you know, I'd done, before I talked to them, I'd done my research on Shopify and, you know, I don't know if folks remember, but at the time, you know, the idea of building like a developer first ecosystem or having really strong, like API docs, like I remember being really impressed by the fact that, you know, with Shopify, you could literally you could create kind of an application and list it on the Shopify store with, you know, maybe there was like a one step review, but it was almost entirely self-serve. And, um, you know, at the time, you know, um, we were trying to build integrations into lots of different platforms because there's lots of different interesting data sets, um, you know, so into backend databases or CRM programs, things like that. And I just remember, you know, Shopify is standing out for one, the quality of the APIs, but then also two is the quality of like the people that knew the APIs. I mean, you could tell it was like, it was, APIs built for developers, but also by developers. Um, so, so I remember we gave them a lot of feedback and asked questions and they were super fast to respond. So, um, you know, so we built that first um, integration for my buddy. And, uh, you know, then we were like, okay, well, you know, Shopify is growing really fast. We should just list this on their store. Let's see what happens. <laughs> and, um, you know, it was great. Like, I, I feel like, you know, it's, I think one of the things that's important with the ecosystem is if you're a platform like Shopify and you see all this opportunity for entrepreneurs and you know you can't cover all of it in the time you want, you know, the fastest way to grow is to invite others to kind of, you know, tag along, right? To partner up and help um, help build things that are highly complementary. And sometimes it's not always clear like where those, you know, what is helpful or not. Um, but I just remember like the, you know, the Shopify, you know, folks that were working in the app store were really helpful in giving us feedback, right? And connecting us with Shopify merchants that, you're like, okay, these folks are of a certain size where they're starting to do more customer segmentation, more personalization and giving us feedback right. from what they were hearing from customers. And uh, yeah, I mean, obviously Shopify was on a, you know, really tremendous like growth swing in 2012, 2013, 2014. And, uh, you know, I think we were fortunate to kind of, you know, be able to join forces and kind of ride part of that wave. Yeah, totally. The way that we talk about it a lot is like, you know, we know we're a very mission driven company. So it's like, we want to make commerce better for everyone. We also want a future with more entrepreneurs and more decentralization. And the way that we see the ecosystem and folks like yourself is just like a force multiplier for that. Right. So like how many, um, founders, innovators like yourself, technology, can we get behind, uh, the mission in the future that, that we want to see. And we're all sort of working towards that in, uh, in lockstep, which is, which is really cool to see. Uh, it's interesting too, because in your story, like it sounds like 
you know, you had the friend who had a Shopify store and that's how you swung it into retail. But the, but the product itself, like you were, you were testing the product against different industries, right? Like, did you know it was going to be commerce that was going to be your focus at the time or, or uh, were you exploring other options? So, so it's interesting. I mean, one of the things we wanted to bring to, um, well, one, one of the cool things, part, part of combining data with, uh, you know, the end customer experience. So let's say in this case, let's say marketing. Not only can you do personalization, but you actually get this chance to kind of close the loop. And so you can do more attribution. Um, so one of the things that we learned is when people buy software, I mean, they're always doing some sort of like cost benefit analysis. And the easier you can make that for them, the better. So, uh, you know, for instance, Shopify, really easy product, right? If this helps me sell on the internet, uh, you know, I can literally see, you know, the dollars coming in and I know I can see the value. I feel it. Or, you know, if you use the Shopify app, you can hear it. Uh, you know, so we knew with Clavio, like we wanted, you know, we wanted to try to get as close as possible, not being like a very sales salesy person. I was like, you know, I don't really want to have to try to guess at how much people are willing to pay for my software. I want it to be right. so obvious. So um, one of the things that we were after was how do we build, you know, if, if we're helping people personalize, uh, let's say emails um, or text messages, how do we know that that personalization like works? I mean, we all think that personalization is a value add, but like, can we actually prove it to people? And um, so early on, we felt like we had to do that. And uh, yeah, one of the cool parts about retail was, I mean, it was it was pretty easy to measure the conversions. Um, you know, with the software business, sometimes you have to do a lot of, a user has to do a lot of things before they finally pay you. So it can be a little bit harder to measure those. Um, but with retail, it was much, the loops are much faster. Um, so I think that made it a little bit easier for people to kind of wrap their head around what we were trying to build. Um, it made it a good like jumping off point. You had mentioned to me that you started off bootstrapping the business for a while, right? Um, and so, you know, late, obviously like your recent, uh, round was announced over $4 billion valuation, $200 million in C a series C funding. This is like awesome, amazing growth. Congratulations to you and the team. What was it like it, at the beginning, like 2012, 2013 days, um, were you trying to raise money then? Was it always like a big venture idea? Or yeah. I, think, I mean, I think our personality when we started, I mean, at the time I, I was, I'm a pretty shy personality. Like I was probably a little more extroverted. Um, uh, or at least we were back then. Uh, and so it was funny, we were, my, we were working out of some co-working space um, at MIT and there were all of these, you know, venture capital firms because kind of seed funding was hot, you know, series A funding, like investing in startups was hot. And they would come by and say, hey, you know, uh, are you are you all interested in applying to our kind of, you know, summer program? And so these venture capital firms had these programs where if you were a startup, they'd give you some co-working space, which we needed because, you know, we didn't have money to afford rents. Uh, and, and even better than that, they not only would they give you free working space, but they'd also give you like a stipend for the summer. So like basically like free cash. Right. And, uh, at the time it was, you know, I mean, we had, you know, server bills and all this kind of stuff. And it's like, well, gosh, a couple thousand bucks goes a long way. So I remember we applied to three or four of those programs and basically struck out on all of them. I mean, some of them were like written essays. Some of them were like recorded video of yourself. We actually have some of those that we show to employees and people like you guys look so dopey. <laughs> uh, but we, we got, we got, we were oh for like three or four. And so I think, you know, I was a little nervous that it was like, oh man, maybe we don't know how to raise money. Um, you know, maybe we're going to go to folks and they're just going to poke holes in our idea. And we're going to be like, yeah, I mean, we're just, you know, we have a couple customers, but we're not all the way there yet. Um, it was hard to articulate our vision. Um, so that was maybe one part of it. I mean, the other side was, uh, you know, in my mom's family, um, you know, she has, I have a, a bunch of aunts and uncles that all work at this small business that's been in my mom's family for probably 50 or 60 years. And I always loved this idea of, I mean, wow, that's like a multi-generational business. I mean, it was only 15 or 20 people, um, but it was like, it was lasting. It was like a business that was real. It was profitable. Like, you know, it, it took care of its you know, employees. Um, and I always felt like, you know, a lot of startups kind of missed that. You know, if, if you go into this, like we're going to burn cash from day one, like you sometimes some of those startups, they just get like acquired or fizzle out. They're never real businesses um, from just right. like a pure, like, you know, self-sustaining. So we just made the decision. You said, you know what? Uh, we were fortunate enough to have enough um, kind of saved up from the jobs we had before we started. Let's see if we can bootstrap this and let's really focus on understanding our customers. What are the problems they're trying to solve? And let's see if we can figure out how to build products that solve those. And um, it took us almost three years. I mean, now it feels like this kind of, I don't know, this hazy blackout period where you like, you kind of forget what happened. And uh, my co-founder and I look, look back on it very nostalgically, but um, yeah, I mean, it was a lot of work and you had to find ways to celebrate small victories. I think the, 
the key to being able to bootstrap for us was, uh, I think the you know, best decision I ever made was kind of cornering my co-founder, Ed, and saying, hey, <laughs> will you partner up? Um, because I, I think we, we kind of knew what we had to do. We'd read enough of the startup books. There was enough kind of literature or blog posts out there. Um, but the mental part is a real grind. And, uh, you know, so whether, you know, whether you're doing it with a co-founder or you're just doing it with a larger community, mm-hmm. um, I mean, that's so helpful because uh, it's, you know, it's, it's a lot of, there's a lot of unknowns and you kind of discover, you know, how to solve those problems and then solve, but it's a lot of trial and error. Um, but uh, yeah, but I mean, we're thankful we did it because then when we got to, you know, uh, actually raise, um, raise money. Like I remember, you know, we were about three years into the business, you know, 2014, 2015. And we were at that point where we actually hired, you know, five or six people, but we had this thing going on with our bank account that if you're, you know, bootstrapped entrepreneur, you'll remember, which is like the kind of the revenue would climb over the course of the month and you'd get to the 31st and then you'd run payroll uh, and you'd pay, you know, your other like bills for the business and it would like drop almost to zero. And so you had this like big sawtooth pattern in your business. <laughs> and, uh, and I remember talking to Ed, I'm like, man, this like stinks. Like if, if we find somebody awesome we want to hire, we have to kind of wait a month or two until we have like enough cash flow to hire them. <laughs> and so anyways, that, that was when we finally went to, um, you know, we talked to some, we got introduced uh, through a CTO I'd worked with in the past um, to some like kind of local Boston angel investors. And I kind of knew we would be able to raise money, but um, you know, obviously you can flip the script pretty dramatically, right? I mean, we, we'd like to talk about owning our own destiny at Clavio. Um, you know, helping that for entrepreneurs, but also like as part of, you know, our, the way we want to operate. And uh, it was just made a big difference. Like the fact that we were bootstrapped and kind of had run lean, had kind of, it just was in our culture. And there's this funny thing that happens with venture capital. Like when you don't need the money, all of a sudden everybody's willing to write you a check. Uh, <laughs> and we've certainly see that. I mean, I think all of the folks that, uh, you know, all the investors we partnered up with, I mean, they're all, they're all great. Um, but I, all of our conversations used to start with, yeah, you like haven't answered any of my emails and like finally you're responding. So, it was, you know, just anyways, you can play a little bit hard to get yeah. um, and kind of flip the tables, um, which I think is, which helps. Yeah, it's it's so interesting because I think like they're around the same time um, I was a founder before joining Shopify. And I think there was a lot of hype on just like raising money right away. Like it was it there was some crazy valuations. There was a lot of money th- being thrown around. Um, and I think it like, I don't think people realize enough, like how much more leverage you can create if you just give yourself some time to create, um, some sustainable foundations where you don't need the money. Like it could, it could definitely help you accelerate, but it just puts you in a different position from the, from the beginning. So I think that's awesome. And it's cool too, because, uh, when we were talking about this before, like, you know, you totally could have taken that path where you just made like a super profitable, um, completely self-owned business, right? Like the beauty of SaaS is, is it, it scales in that direction regardless. So, um, uh, did you ever think like, did you ever think about continuing in that direction before, before you guys decided to, uh, uh, to raise money? Yeah. It's a good, I mean, it's a good question. So there was this, I remember this is like kind of pivot point where you work so hard to get kind of profitable and sustainable. And that's, uh, once you get there, it's kind of like you've arrived, but you're like, well, where did I arrive to exactly? Right. Uh, your, your life changes. You go from being worried about, you know, whether you're going to get there to, you know, it's like, okay, well, hmm, now we have, you know, now we're generating cash. Like, what do we do with that? So I remember we had like a couple of long chats. I'm like, okay, so what do we want to do? And I, I don't know. I, don't, I mean, I don't know if it's, you know, but like just as an entrepreneur, I, I was always like, you know what? Like it kind of like imagine being at a casino, like we put all our chips in and we've been lucky enough to, you know, kind of get this far. Like, you know, what would be fun is like, let's just put them all back in the middle and see what happens. <laughs> totally. uh, so I don't know if you felt this, the same way, but like, that, I mean, that was the fun part. I was like, you know what? I, I think we're all really, I mean, if you're in technology, I think we're really privileged to get to work there. And so it's, we've always tried to optimize for like, let's just try to have the biggest impact we can. And let's not worry so much about the risk profile. Um, so yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's how we decided, like, let's just go for broke. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I, t- I totally hear that. Um, cool. So what's been some of like the biggest, uh, lessons you've learned through the scaling journey? Like when I, when, you know, you're talking about these stories a couple of years ago, like Clavio's growth has been, has been incredible. Like we're, you know, it's one of the most sophisticated marketing automation platforms out there. Um, like, you know, what are the, some of like the biggest learning, learning moments you've had through the way? Gosh. Um, well, I, we've, we've tried a lot of things and, uh, definitely learned a lot. I mean, you know, in terms of, Things that maybe we kind of knew, but then really got to experience. I mean, the first is, you know, it's it's all about learning. 
and um, just leveling yourself up. And then, you know, obviously you want to surrender, you want to work with other people that are also focused on leveling themselves up. So we, we have the saying at Clavio is like, we look for people that are high slope. Um, we kind of don't care, you know, about the skills and experience you come in with. Um, we look for people that whose trajectory, whose ability to learn is really steep. Um, right. The cool part about that is you think about that, there's actually, I mean, well, how do you figure out, how do you interview somebody to see if they're high slope? Well, you just ask them about their past. I mean, you ask them for experiences of like, hey, if you know, like, can you tell me about this? You know, tell me about something hard you've learned in the last year and what was it? Right. And the funny thing is, is people that are high slope, they're just like gush about it because they're so, I mean, they're just <laughs> interested and curious, right? Right. Um, so I think that's made a huge difference. Uh, we try to, you know, as individuals, like try to build deep expertise, um, you know, in a bunch of different disciplines. I mean, some folks talk about the intersectionality of like knowing a bunch of diff different disciplines and kind of like, that's kind of the magic. Um, you know, one of the ways we talk about it is we don't want to have a huge team. Like the number of people that uh, Clavio employs is, is actually like, we look at that as a vanity stat. Like that's not really interesting right. to us. In fact, we think it's actually gets harder because if you think about it, you know, if you work a small team, there's kind of fewer people you have to keep in the know and communicate well with. As teams grow, like every time it doubles, you know, we all know like the number of connections, you know, um, grows quadratically. So it's like, it gets harder and harder. Right. So anyways, one of the things we really focus on, like, how do we be, how do we become an environment that's like a learning, you know, just really conducive to people leveling themselves up. So some of that was hiring. And then, um, you know, internally, uh, I mean, we've gone so far as, uh, we think of Clavio as like how it should feel like kind of a modern university or, um, you know, what happens after you get out of school, like people kind of go in this thing where it's like, well, do I just learn my job and then do it for the next 50 years? You know, right. how, work should feel like you're at college, uh, you're in school, you're working on projects, you're leveling up and, you know, you're kind of, you're acquiring those skills. So how do we do that? Um, so anyways, that's been something we've invested in a lot, um, even to the point now where we have this, you know, part, part of our, you know, um, uh, within HR, we have this actual Clavio University where we actually have like a course catalog. Like you can pick from, you know, 10, 20 different courses that we think just, you know, you know, kind of workers of the future are going to need. So, you know, I mean, it's things like everything from like written communication to, hey, everybody should know at least some like programming or software architecture concepts to, hey, what is machine learning? How does it apply? Um, so anyways, we, we've worked hard on, uh, you know, being building a learning environment. Um yeah, I don't know. I, I, I could go on and on, but like, I mean, that's probably the biggest one for us is like the people you keep and just make sure you're constantly investing back in education. Yeah, totally. We uh, similarly like have a life story concept at Shopify where it's like where you, you really kind of look for for patterns and just like the person's curiosity and ability to to kind of thrive on change and learn, um, which is which is so true to like even as you're speaking and the story you just told us like it's, it's so in line with just how also how entrepreneurs think and entrepreneurs are our customers themselves. Right. So it's, it's important to kind of have the, that mindset. Like people often are like, well, how I'm sure that you, people ask you like, well, how did you know how to raise money or how did you know how to build this thing? Or, you know, and it, as you've shared today, like so much of it is you, you just sort of figure it out. Like <laughs> whether you like, you know, you're just deeply curious and you, you learn or you're just in the situation and you kind of, uh, have to figure out hacks to, to, to learn what you need to know to keep going. Yeah. I mean, do you have any moments from like, I mean, you remember, you know, uh, with your business where you felt like, boy, I'm going to fake it till I make it. I mean, that's something I felt like I've had to do, gosh, like dozens of times. Oh, there was like a moment where we, when we were trying to raise money that we were like, you know, we need to kind of show some legitimacy around, uh, around what we're doing. And we ended up like pulling off this like pop-up shop in the middle of Nolita with like barely any money in the bank account to be able to to make it happen. But we we somehow did it. And then it got some press coverage, which got the attention of some of the people that we needed to get the attention from. And it kind of like just snowballed from there. Um, you know, there's there's just so many, so many great stories. I think you just you just f figure out as you're on the journey. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, I, I used to be uh, I may have not invited on many as many. Uh, I don't know. We, we call them like, you know, future customer calls. Um, other people may call them like sales calls. But I, I used to go on a lot of those with our, uh, you know, fo folks that are on our customer teams. And, uh, and I just love talking about where we were going so much so that I might sometimes overstep the line on what Clavio could do today. And uh, to the point where, you know, our, uh, you know, our customer team would have to kind of pull me back and be like, oh, actually, well, hang on a second. Like, we can't assert that we do that yet. But it was like, well, OK, but we're going to get there really soon. And then I bring it back to you know, our product team be like, hey, so I, I told somebody we had this. I think we need to figure out how to build this. 
Because you're like 10 steps that, ahead. Yeah. yeah, you're like 10 <laughs> steps ahead and where you know like the, the product can be and where you want to go. And so, it, it, yeah, and, and then you're like, everyone else is like, whoa, hold on a second. <laughs> we're, we're, not, we're not there yet. What, like, you know, you were talking about the future. Like, tell me, what is the future for Clavio? Like, are what are you most excited about um, going forward? Like, what's your, you know, your vision for the next 10 years? Yeah, so I think there's a, there's a bunch of companies that... Um, I think are focused on the, you know, like, let's call it the direct to X, direct to consumer, you know, direct to human kind of movement. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that fascinated us when we started Clavio was this idea of, you know, the internet's this big network. It's kind of like a highway system, but it's like a digital highway system. You know, you, you and I can be here chatting in real time, even though we're not physically close to each other, you know, sending somebody a message or data or information who could be on the other side of the world. We can do that in, you know, milliseconds. Um, so one of the things we thought about was, you know, there's obviously there are systems and networks that exist for people to exchange, you know, text, images, videos, um, money, you know, then it's like, you know, it's like commerce, which is, you know, what Shopify is all about. You know, what we thought about for Clavio was, man, what would it be like if you could take kind of a picture of yourself, um, but an authentic version of yourself and connect it to the internet? Like, what if you could be yourself at internet scale? And, um, you know, we thought about, you know, for us as people, like we know how to be authentic, but we can only be in one place at one time. You know, we all have to shut off for eight or nine hours every night. Uh, you know, so what would it take if we could take who we are, our personality, and just connect to the internet so as many people could experience it whenever they want? Um, and so that that, would, I mean, that was kind of the thesis behind Clavio is like, what, what could you apply that to? And then obviously, I think it makes a lot of sense for businesses and retailers and merchants. You know, I mean, there if you're a consumer business, you have way more customers than you can ever actually talk to. So how do you get them to see the best side of yourself, you know, kind of at internet scale. Um, so with that though, like, it's interesting. We thought about kind of the topology or how the inter internet is structured. And what kind of struck struck us was to the extent that their personalization was possible, a lot of it was kind of being governed by a handful of like big internet companies. Uh, I mean, it's like, even though you and I can, you know, in theory with the internet, we can send each other information or we can communicate, you know, direct with each other. The reality was a lot of us were just working through big platforms. Um, and I think that was because if you right. think about the first era of the internet, um, it was all like, well, it's just building internet infrastructure was hard. Like, you know, uh, building servers was hard. Building software was hard. Like building, you know, great user experiences was hard. Um, but what we feel like the next age of the internet is going to be, it's going to be all about giving people, rather than those tools being kind of centralized in one place, wouldn't it be awesome if those tools were just democratized? And so we think about, you know, there's a lot of, you know, uh, you know, um, platforms out there that let you publish yourself or run your business, you know, um, you know, uh, marketplaces and the such, but like, wouldn't it be cool if everybody could kind of take the best parts of that technology and then just make it their own. Right. Uh, and that's kind of what we're really excited about. So we think about that about as, you know, so our mission is to help creators, um, you know, businesses, individuals, uh, own their own destiny, like be in control. And, totally. you know, when I think about Shopify and, you know, whether it's uh, making commerce better for everyone or arming the rebels. I mean, I think these are all like, they're all shades of the same theme. Totally. And I think there's a handful of companies that are after this thesis of the internet really should be connecting everybody almost as individual nodes in a graph. Yeah. And so what happens when you do that and how powerful is that? Um, and so anyways, I'm just really excited to explore that because I think, I mean, if you look at the last 25 years of the internet, I mean, we've seen and experienced a lot of things. It's kind of crazy to think about what if we gave everybody the kind of sophistication of some of the biggest tech companies in the world today, but we made that available to anybody. I mean, just think about how many entrepreneurs are gonna be able to you know, do incredible things with that if they're empowered that way. I love that, yeah. It's it's basically the the theme of like, you know, there's, there's all these platforms emerging, like you said, it's like this version of the internet, um, but are they using the scale to centralize or decentralize? And the, you know, for Shopify, the most important thing is like, we always want to leverage our collective scale, like not just us, but everything that's going on in the ecosystem to to distribute the unfair advantage to all entrepreneurs, right? So that we democratize access and create a world with more of them. Uh, but it's it's to your point, totally sort of like a different worldview of the future. Like, do you, do you use the scale to centralize or do you use it to decentralize? It's kind of awesome to see like all of the energy of all of these ecosystem companies going towards the future that we want to see. It's awesome. Okay, so with only a couple minutes left, Andrew, like tell me people who are joining the platform for the first time today, developers that are building their businesses in Shopify's ecosystem, 
Like, what are some pieces of advice that you would give a new founder? Uh, cool. So, I mean, so, some of this is just generic to entrepreneurship in general, but, um, you know, I mean, the first is, is like, don't wait to get started, just get going. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I used quitting my job as kind of a forcing function. I mean, I'd had all these like kind of side night and weekend projects, but I was like, you know, I'm never going to be really all in until I'm in. So that's not to say that you have to kind of go full time, but, you know, the sooner you take that idea that's been floating around in your head and you kind of get to work on it, uh, the better. Um, I think once you do that, you know, the, the big endorphin rush uh, that everybody gets is when they finally ship something and they get that first, you know, that first user, uh, maybe that first customer. And so I think you want to, I mean, this obviously applies to Shopify, but you want to pick technologies um, and, uh, you know, tools and, you know, let's say platforms to work with that make it really easy to get going. Because uh, the last thing you want to do is spend months, you know, kind of waiting through the waters just to ship something. Um, so anyways, I, mean, I think what's great about, you know, uh, Shopify that was probably you know true when we started, you know, eight, nine years ago and still true today is it's just a real focus on like developer experience. Um, so I just, we have something I kind of tell myself is we spent a bunch of time early days with, uh, some companies that didn't have, like, they didn't really think about APIs. They, they barely knew what they were. They were kind of like old school APIs doing like maybe soap. Like they didn't realize what rest was. Um, nowadays we think about like GraphQL. It's just, I think it's important to like try to optimize for getting something shipped as fast as you can. Um, and then, so obviously, I mean, the magic of that is you want to go somewhere where it's like the development's going to be really easy. Uh, and then there's go where people kind of like already are. I mean, that was a big part of our strategy was like it finding customers is really hard. Anything you can do to make it easy to find the first one, two, five, ten helps a ton. Um, right. cause you just want to be like, you want to be in a, like fast feedback loops that are, um, yeah, really iterative. So I don't know. Just get get started today. Don't waste time. Like now, like right after this, you know, after, after you listen to this, it would be a good time <laughs> to get started. Uh, and then, yeah, just, I mean, go where people are and go with, go with people that have like similar ethos to you. Like, I mean, we've always talked, I mean, we just talked about like democratization. You know, I think there's some people that care a lot about like, you know, the speed of their product, the user experience. I mean, you want to, you know, anytime you, it's whether it's people that you hire or people that you work with, that you found companies with, um, or companies that you partner up with. You want to pick people that just have the same values. Um, it just make, honestly, it just makes like life more fun. So totally, uh, I aim for those things. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much, Andrew. It's been uh, a blast having you on. Um, thanks everyone here for listening to Beyond the Build. You can learn more about Shopify and joining the ecosystem um, at developers.shopify.com. Thanks so much. Mm-hmm.